Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Conquer the Clutter podcast for September the 6th. Um, we're going to do a little bit of a review, and I guess it's based on the fact that I've had an extraordinary week um, with requests for urgent, uh, massive cleanups um, because enforcement agents could be the landlord, could be the condominium association, could be practically anybody who's got a right to know legally um, is interested in the condition of the property. So I kind of changed my plan and I thought, you know, maybe the universe is speaking to us and maybe I'm taking for granted that none of my people in this community are facing anything like that. Or even if they aren't, are living in dread of that happening. So I thought we'd go over um, some of the things we've talked about over many, many podcasts and just put it together into one podcast that will remain in the library for who knows the next person who needs to know everything that's important when you're just really not comfortable with the condition of your property. So you and I both know that long before clutter uh, becomes um, a, uh, an issue um, that um, any of the enforcement agents like fire codes, um, municipal ordinances represent an immediate threat to your safety or the safety of anybody else, um, if you don't uh, deal with uh, the uh, environment <clears throat> up front on a regular ongoing basis, um, you can be put into a real spin, leaving you really demoralized. And frankly, I don't want any of that happening um, to anybody, uh, particularly uh, people who are part of our group, all right? I don't want to think of you folks out there being demoralized. And so um, rather than, I thought I'd just kind of bring it to the forefront, rather than making your sole focus the uh, condition of the property and that unrelenting, never-ending, nagging feeling that you've got to get ahead of it. You've got to stay on top of it, cleaning up your spaces. Um, I would like uh, to kind of add a focus, which is equally important, because there are two essentials for any form of long-term success, all right? One is getting help for the underlying reasons that are specific to you all right, about why this happens and why it keeps happening to whatever degree it does. And the second is, let's not kid ourselves, at some point, in some ways, hopefully you're working on habituating the cleanup of your spaces, all right? Because the truth is, if you don't focus on both essential components. And remember, we are not necessarily exactly the same people with exactly the same feelings and attitudes and fears and strengths as we were last week or last month. So we need to stay in touch with how yesterday might have changed us, what we learned, what we became concerned about. All right. We are growing, learning, developing human beings. And so that being aware of who we are and what the balance of our strengths and challenges are, all right, is one of the essential components. And <clears throat> getting help um, as you become more aware for the underlying, what I call feeders, that keep this challenge active in your life, hopefully with you on the winning end of it, and end up with us being able to habituate the kinds of attitudes, the kind of self-management that allows us to manage the environment equally, all right, and manage whether it's just 
self-reporting behaviors, or whether it's a full-blown disorder, there are two essentials for long-term success. And the likelihood of you having that success without attending to your needs, who am I today, and what do I bring to this, all right? And why does this keep happening? As well as what are some hints that Elaine has given me to make it easier to get started and stay moving forward, all right? If you don't balance those two things, highest probability is long-term success is going to be a real struggle and it doesn't have to be. And I, I want you folks, because you invest every week coming to this podcast, I want you to be the most informed people who can help maybe other people. You never know what you're learning today. Yes, how it can help you, but then how you can pass that on to somebody else who doesn't even know about the podcast that you're going to meet this week, this month, this year. Okay. And I'm Above all, I want to help um, and be a positive force for you folks in particular and my clients never having to repeat a relapse, all right? That is just the fast track to demoralizing yourself. So let us, let us avoid that at all costs because it's absolutely unnecessary, all right? So... Let's do this very short recap that I talked about. Two essentials and I'm, that I'm talking about are getting help for the underlying reasons, the feeders that you hoard or that you repeat way too much clutter for you to be comfortable with. All right. It's not the same for everybody, the underlying reasons. There is no pat answer. At a population level, there are some common themes, but how you as an individual um, are affected by that or influenced by that, that's, that's you specifically. So today I want you folks to make what we're going to talk about specific to you. All right. Not just general information and notes you're writing down. I want you to bring it home. I want it to be useful in a very practical way for you. All right. So and I want it because I don't want it interfering with your life any more than it absolutely has to. Or I want tomorrow to be a better day than it than today is because you know more about yourself you're aware and you've got more more to work with to habituate what you need to do to get out of this situation and stay out of it not perfectly all right we're not looking for the other extreme the second essential component is we do have to get around to cleaning up and decluttering our environment the enduring clutter is an unnecessary consequence of either you not being aware enough specifically about what your needs and challenges are and how to address those or a full-blown disorder. Some of you, I'm sure, are living with a full-blown hoarding disorder. All right. So that means that you need to get help in the way and in the time that you need it. And that fluctuates as well, all right? So today, I'm hoping that we I can help you add to your awareness of what elements are still active, all right? In your attitudes, beliefs, fears, habits that keep this problem um, present specific to you all right then by the end of it and i'm hoping um you have lots of uh, questions or lots of observations in the chat box i'm hoping we'll have some time that we can triage some of those as well and process uh, what we've learned today all right so obviously in the decluttering process working at your pace all right, 
and respecting your preferences that decide what should stay and what should go. And sometimes, depending on energy levels, that can just be getting the recycling out. All right. So it's not just about the essentials of the best things in your environment, deciding what about those should stay or go, depending on the volume of the buildup. It's also about the day to day things. Another important element is the pace. All right. That's why I ask you when you're starting out literally, literally for about a two week period, because it takes about two to three weeks to habituate anything. All right. Start out with 15 minutes. Set the timer. Work at your pace. And I know many of you find that when you're working at your pace, you you get on a roll. All right. And it Next time you wake up or you become aware, it's two hours in. Please, if you're just restarting, all right, or you're not doing that intensive often enough to stay on top of things, please try the other way, all right? You can always, when you habituate that 15 minutes every day, regularly, hopefully at a specific time that is declutter time. All right. Nothing else is allowed to interfere with that 15 minutes. And we can all do that people. All right. When you do that, after about two to three weeks, you can probably count on being able to add another 15 minutes for the next week, and maybe even another 15 minutes for the third or fourth or fifth week. Okay. Add it by small increments and make sure that whatever little extra you add regularly, you work to habituate it. It is the little bit you do every day that is going to get you where you need to be and keep you there. It is not the massive investment of a major um, cleanup. Okay. And we're looking for for perfectionists among us, word to the wise, we are looking for reasonably healthy and safe spaces. If you need to know about safety factors, go on the webcast recordings that are on hoarding.ca and look up the podcast on safety. All right. And just refresh your memory. All right. So, if you're unsure whether your piles mean that you have hoarding disorder, maybe maybe you're still asking yourself that question. I want to repeat something, all right? Let's look at the definition one more time. Because this podcast is meant to be a standalone podcast for people just tripping over the fact that they have a hoarding problem. So, there must be what most people would describe as an excessive accumulation. And I say a failure to resolve, all right? And resolve proportionately. If you can do that one thing in and one thing out, or, you know, I've I've had it for a year and I'm not using it, so I can regularly go through and thin out my build, the buildup of things, you probably don't have a hoarding problem, all right? You probably you've got better use of your time than being on a clutter podcast. However, if that's a struggle for you, all right, that regular proportionate, whatever, before you bring it in, like me in the white blouses, we've all heard that story, all right, when whatever you bring in, before you bring it in, before you acquire it, you ask yourself, where is its home space going to be? And if there's something else in that space, now what? Where does that go? And probably not to the garage. All right. So <clears throat> what most people would describe as an excessive accumulation and a failure to resolve proportionately. 
second, some or all of your living spaces. Right now, as I'm saying this, take out that paper and pen that I ask you to keep handy. And I want you to write down each of the spaces in your environment that are aggravating you with clutter. Some or all of the living spaces can no longer be used for their intended purpose. It's not that you can't write at the table or you can't eat at the table. It's that things have to be moved before you do. And it's not a one-off that they have to be moved because you've got a temporary job going on there. This is a regular thing. All right. When somebody comes in to visit, you have to move things off that second chair. You have to move things around in order to use spaces. And please, under no circumstances, allow those spaces to be the safety corridor, your entrance and exit, egress and entrance routes. All right. Anything near a heat source, nothing on the floor in the kitchen where you cook. All right. You need to have free, clear access in case of an emergency. And the third um, um, criteria is that the spaces can't be used for their intended purpose. All right. You you can eat. You just can't eat where one would normally eat. Um, you can sit. You can work at something, but you need to prepare that area or remedy it. And if you're not distressed about it, somebody is distressed about it. Or if they're not actively distressed, it's because they don't know the truth about the environment. But if they did know the truth about the environment, they would have cause to be concerned. Those three criteria need to be ticked even to a small minimal degree for something to be on some level a hoarding situation not all hoarding situations are equal okay <clears throat> all right now I have a long list of people who have the right to know about us just know that no matter who they are whether they are friends family or the traditional enforcement agents we all are accountable in the same way. You are not peculiar or special or unique in that way, all right? No man is an island. We all have to meet the same criteria for safety, all right? And over the past, gosh, 22 years, I've learned, especially from my clients, that when it comes to decluttering, here's something else I want to raise the awareness of. There's nothing you have to do. People have the right to create the crisis, no matter how good or how bad the situation is. They have the right and the ability to create the crisis that they sometimes unconsciously don't realize they need. Even if the environment represents a serious a very serious hoarding situation. People have the right and the ability to create that crisis. <clears throat> and sometimes, sadly, it's I always find it profoundly sad when even a client of mine or a new client has done this. Sadly, to witness that the choices people uh, need they and they don't realize they need that level of crisis. All right. They created in order to demonstrate that there is a crisis sufficient and in creating the crisis results in somebody else making them solve um, the problem, conduct an intervention. I really uh, don't. I do an intervention as the absolute last resort. All right. <clears throat> okay. Now, the reason I do these podcasts every week and the reason I make them free of charge is so that this never happens to you or anyone you know or anyone you care about. Okay. 
People who bring on this enforced intervention are usually not even conscious or aware of needing that heightened level of crisis, right? In order to make them face and deal with the problem that they have. Please, please don't be one of them. If there's any way that through this podcast, I can prevent one person from doing that to themselves, all right? And also know that better results are never, ever gained by ramping up the emotion and the stress, all right? And don't allow yourself to be someone who uses extremes of any kind to cope with any problem. Every person facing the heightened stress of any type of intervention, even a minimal one, needs to ask themselves, and I'm asking you to do that for yourself right now, which is why I've made this week's a podcast about this topic. Okay, ask yourself, even if it doesn't mean that your environment right now is out of control, if you're here, especially if you're here weekly, all right, I'm sure you don't come to see my sunny smile every week. I'm sure that there's another reason that, and probably it's that your environment isn't in some way what you want and need it to be. And that means that even if it isn't the worst situation, it still is costing you a part of your life. Let that sink in. And perhaps that part is some of your mental health, some of your physical health along with it. So please, right now, ask yourself, how much crisis and loss of control do I need in order to handle the clutter in my life? Do you really need the clutter to become so severe or so unrelentingly annoying, frustrating, embarrassing, shaming that anyone else gets to have an opinion? Okay. Imagine what it's like to have someone else have the right to have an opinion about how to intervene, how to set and enforce limits for you, or monitor your life choices, even if it's only by friendly opinion, even if it's only that casual comment about excessive clutter in your environment. If you don't want to give up that degree of control, please. Do what's necessary and be willing to consider the following, okay? I'm going to give you some handy dandy little starting points. If you're not getting to the bottom of why this keeps happening, in whatever form uh, it becomes available, that the help, the underlying uh, causes, the help for the underlying causes is what I'm stressing right now. Okay, figure out what the primary top three causes are. All right, and then you figure out where the appropriate and best help, coaching, courses, groups, whatever are. Okay, in whatever form that help becomes available, Please get help for those underlying reasons you're hoarding, all right? Get hoarding-informed coaching, even whether you can afford it or not. Spend an hour a week, spend an hour a day going over podcast after podcast after podcast and chewing on it and incorporating it. That coaching doesn't have to cost you. That's why those podcasts are in the webcast recordings. And there are a lot more to come that haven't even made their way over to um, this, this website, the new website. Okay. And they will help. These, these podcasts will help. All right. The group's and I'm not pitching groups, but the groups that I've talked to that are coming up in the fall and in the winter, living with ADD and ADHD, procrastination, um, adverse childhood experiences, those three groups are coming up, all right? Um, 
between probably sometime in October. And uh, we're just putting together the the um, ad for it now. Um, if you can join in those, great. If you can't, make your homework weekly one of the podcasts, okay? And gradually, and then incorporate. Don't just listen. Don't just take and write notes. Make those notes meaningful for you so that they become effective with the clutter. And begin today to say two phrases to yourself, all right? And then not just say them, do your absolute best to act on them. And as well as you possibly can. Again, we're not looking for perfection because when it doesn't happen perfectly, what happens? Most sensible people give up. They stop. Don't. Do them the best that you possibly can. First phrase, don't put it, right? You can write this one down, okay? Don't put it down, put it away. And putting it away means at least for the meantime. Maybe you can't get to where it actually goes. And its home space should be all together now. I hope I hear voices. I hope I hear voices saying this. All right. It should be no. Thank you, Suzanne. It should be no more than four to five steps where you habitually, usually, normally, it's normal to use it. Why? Because that will increase the probability you put it away. All right. And if things are less than ideal right now, put it as close to where it actually should go as possible. Second phrase I want you to say regularly. I do this all the time. Just do it now. It never gets easier. All right. And I know I'm repeating myself because I've told you many, many times that I say this a minimum of 20 times a day. Nobody likes to put things away. Everybody likes shortcuts and life is busy. It's hectic, right? Don't put it down. Put it away. Just do it now. Add your name. Just do it now. It never gets easier. And the reason that I reinforce that for myself, because I am busy, and I know you are too. If I put it down, I now have five jobs. Okay. Where I had it in my hand a moment ago, and it would have taken me no more than five, six, seven steps to put it away, well and truly, finally put it away. If I put it down, I have to see it. And believe me, when you're in a rush, that's no small feat. I have to be aware of it. That's number one. I have to, when I see it, think, what are you doing there? That's not where you go. Then I have to figure out, what was I doing with you? Then I have to figure out, where do you go? Oh, yeah. Four or five steps away. I've, then I have to pick you up and I have to put you away anyway. Doesn't it just make sense? Do an audit of your spaces, particularly the most aggravating ones, or start with the ones that you get the, the most payoff for. What are the areas of your home that you use the most? And what is in that space? And what is in that space that shouldn't be? And what isn't in that space that should be? And try to try to lessen the distance by, you know, I say four or five steps, even if you have to go to six steps, you'd be surprised there's something very powerful about that six, seven step that influences a lot of people just to put it down. It feels like you're having to cross the whole house. All right. So do an audit of the most annoying spaces and see what you can do as far as figuring out, revamping what is there. All right. Now, <clears throat> okay, we told you about the five steps. All right. So 
if you incorporate those two sayings to yourself and you say them regularly, you will be really, really, really surprised uh, at how you will naturally begin solving the clutter piles. It, it's not rocket science. All right. It isn't some deep, profound reason. It's made up of both of those sayings. And if you pick things up, you say the saying, those two sayings to yourself and you put them away. And you also say it at the performing your daily activities of living. You have a winning combination, all right? And you will be surprised um, at how those problem piles start solving themselves from both ends. It's not a deep secret. It's not a deep psychological profound thing, all right? The answer is right in front of you and you can do it. I know you can, all right? So... Not only will you be solving piles that are there, you'll be preventing new ones. Huh? And believe me, the feeling you'll get when you look around and gradually it's thinner and thinner and thinner. All right. Next time you walk by something and you see it and that's not where it belongs, pick it up one thing at a time. You're on your way to the loo. You're on your way to the front door. You're on your way upstairs to do something, to get something. Pick up one thing and put it away. You'll be surprised. All right. And the real payoff is that all of you can do this beginning today. So please do it. Just do it. Let's have a look, though, at determining what started the the. The, the piles that are resistant, <clears throat> okay, probably started um, generally one of two ways. You started out with a plan, all right, and somehow something intervened. An event intervened, something happened, all right, and the plan got abandoned, or you found that the plan didn't work that well it wasn't a well-founded plan all right what when you look at it at a at a pile or an area of your home right now i want you to do it i want this to have real right now value all right look at a pile look at an area and ask yourself when did you start when did you start accumulating in the first place, all right? And what started? What was it? And even if you have a vague recollection of what it was that started that pile, write that down. Name the pile, when, how long, roughly, long-term, two weeks, yesterday and if you can remember what happened what happened that that became your best choice all right now I want you to reverse that nobody said this was just going to be a listening exercise okay now I want you to look around your space and I want you to choose a space. Choose one space for you and I together today to start to deal with. One space. Now, consider what makes up that particular accumulation in that space. Because spaces Accumulations in spaces can have differing uh, requirements depending on what makes up the accumulation, right? Ask yourself then, <coughs> sorry, 
What influenced you to place each of those items that make up that accumulation there in that spot? What influenced you? And write that down. I was tired. I was in a hurry. I didn't know what else to do with it. There are so many other piles that didn't feel like it mattered. I meant to put it away, but I got distracted and I forgot I put it there. I just put it down and then I forgot. And the reason I want you to do this is because this is a really good shortcut, a really good shortcut to figuring out what are the underlying causes that any of those piles have accumulated? And then the next question I'd like you to answer is, hmm, once there was a little pile, what influenced me to leave them there? It's one thing to put something down and create a pile, but it's a slightly different issue when you leave that pile there. And there may be different reasons for different types of things. Be aware of that, all right? The mail is a good example. How many people, when the mail comes in, don't take five minutes right then and there and open it and figure out, oh, there's a bill due, or oh, that's a check, or oh, I can throw that out. This is all, all junk mail. How many people here, I'd like to hear that in the chat, actually don't triage your mail as you get it. Now I'd like you to put down what types of things are more likely to become piles? Are there certain types of things that you're having difficulty deciding about or figuring out or making a priority to put away? All of these can become subjects for f future podcasts. Do the work for me now. Send it in the chat box. All right. Now, I'm betting that it wasn't your original plan for this area to become cluttered. Am I pretty safe in assuming that? What were the ideas, the needs, or the vision behind the plan for this thing? or these types of things? What were your ideas? What was the vision you had? And how far off that vision are you right now? Were there events or choices that prompted you to change your plan or to abandon it? It happens. So right now, let's accept, all right? We're not going to beat ourselves up about it. There's no point. There's no point. Nobody ever, ever accomplished anything difficult by feeling less about themselves. So let's just relieve that habit right now, okay? Let's observe ourselves. <clears throat> And accept that temporarily these things are where they are. If the pile or piles have become greater, was it because you lost focus about the plan? Losing focus might indicate that you've got some degree of ADD or ADHD that you're living with. Not a full-blown disorder necessarily, just traits. You started something 
and you had one vision, but as you continued, the vision wasn't coming to life. It wasn't actually getting actuated, all right? And so you abandoned it. Are you a bit of a perfectionist? Hmm? If so, when and what influenced the change of focus? Did something happen during that time frame? And it's just a matter of you getting back to it. Sometimes I know that when I go into a situation and I'm working with someone, particularly when I'm starting with them and I see piles, I always go to the bottom of the pile and I pull something out that has a date on it. And then we sit down and we talk about what was happening in that person's life around about that date. All right. And that's a really good shortcut. You might do that for yourself rather than feeling overwhelmed by the enduring clutter, the persistent aggravating clutter. Go down to the bottom, pull something out, particularly something with a date on it and say, well, presumably this is when it started. What in heaven's name was happening about that time? Because those are the types of situations or events that you need to be aware of. This is living proof that you're particularly vulnerable to getting a little off focus or derailed by them. Try it. It works. Sometimes when you start to put a, a plan in place, you encounter a barrier to moving forward that you hadn't anticipated. I've got one of those right now. I plan to have a lot of things printed off. I bought two new tor toner cartridges. And do you think my Canon printer will work this morning? No, it's got a default error. Um, so sometimes the best plan, you encounter a glitch. All right. Are there glitches that I can help you overcome? to get you started on why that pile exists? If so, put it in the chat. That too can be a subject, a topic for an, an upcoming podcast. Because whatever they are, they represent barriers to moving forward. Let's not make them bigger or more insurmountable. There are answers, probably six good answers to anything. The trick is knowing what the problem is or having a hunch. All right. And whatever those barriers are, if they still exist, that's a pretty good reason for why the pile still exists too. Let's demystify it. Right. So when you look at the piles, do you see a collection of anything that is common to those piles? What makes up those piles? An example would be documents, papers, okay? Unopened mail, bills, open mail but not dealt with, receipts that you want to keep. Are those dates associated with anything? Because if you leave them in the pile, they're all going to be past due or an opportunity is going to be missed. Or you're going to have, you're going to be living with somebody. This pile becomes a, a thing that nags at you, that causes you to reflect negatively on yourself. Or worse yet, causes you to put blinders on and just not see them. All right. And you can't block out the bad without blocking out the good. When you decide not to notice things, you're not noticing the good either. Is it a surprise that you feel not your best? There are good things that are going to happen today. If you're walking around with blinders on because you can't stand to look at the clutter, you're missing the good stuff too. And that's true. Okay. All right. 
whatever it was, if it represents a, a pile, your plan got derailed and you along with it. All right. Now, <clears throat> just pick any pile. You've probably made friends with a few of them by the time um, we're this far into the podcast. Ask yourself, okay, what did derail you? And is that event or barrier still active? Or sometimes a barrier will, it's got a due date, all right? And after that, it doesn't represent a barrier, are any of these piles the legacy of that? Or was it not? If, if it's not a one-off problem that caused that pile or that combination of piles to accumulate, is it a habitual problem? All right. It wasn't actually part of an intervening event. Has it become habituated just to put things down? And when you put them down, leave them down and not come back to them and deal with it. Okay. Are you better at starting multiple things rather than finishing them? Okay. One thing started one thing finished. One thing started, one thing finished. Are you somebody who has a lot of projects on the go? My advice to my clients is <clears throat> have one project in the works and whatever product you need for that pro project. And if you're not living in a severely hoarded environment, have one other project in the wings and you can start scouting out but not acquiring the product for that project in the wings finish what you start otherwise you accomplish nothing you have a lot of started projects and nothing to show for it Excuse me. When was the last time you were able to assign a permanent place to things? And you all know the, the trick to do that, right? You hold the thing or you touch the thing so that you're really in the moment with it. And you say, if I was looking for you, where would the first place be that I'd look? And whatever comes to your mind that is its first place because that is always where you're going to look first. That is where it belongs. And chances are that will be in a location where you would actually use it and access it. That doesn't mean, though, that by trying to put it in its home space, you can actually reach that. So long as you are not creating a health or safety hazard, Put it as close to where that space is that you said in your mind. All right. And as you work your way around and you get to that space, you can resolve that. Something else may be occupying that space right now. It's okay to put things as close to where they actually go, where you will actually look for them first. And that will be a future project. And gradually you just work your way around the room until you get to that spot. However long it takes, you know where it is. You can see where it is in the meantime. All right. It's a compromise. It's a harm reduction approach. It's not perfection. It's not an ideal solution. But sometimes on our way to ideal, we need interim just make sure that the interim steps are never, ever a health or safety hazard. All right. Okay. So um, I think I'm going to look at the, the uh, chat and just see. We have, um, we have lots of chat here, don't we? We'll see you next week. Take care, everybody. Bye.